Hello, I'm Professor Claire Steves, and this is my Saga Spaces talk. Hello, I'm Sunita Shroff, and I'm your presenter for this afternoon's Saga Spaces talk. Today, we'll be exploring how the trillions of microbes that live in your gut, called the microbiome, can keep us fit and healthy as we age. Researchers studying at the new frontier of human biology are continuing to unearth its many secrets. And one of those brilliant researchers is our speaker today, Professor Claire Steves. A warm welcome to you all to the Saga Spaces community, where we come together to experience the joy of learning. Our live online talks are an opportunity for you to learn something enhancing, enriching and empowering with practical tips and a valuable take home advice too. They're also fully interactive, so you can ask questions and you can tell us how you feel with our one tap emojis. Claire is a Professor of Ageing and Health at King's College London and the Clinical Director of Twins UK. Now, Twins UK is a population study which aims to understand how our genes relate to our health. Claire's research focuses on better understanding how ageing works and what we can do about it. Claire is also a consultant geriatrician at Guy's and St. Thomas's NHS Foundation Trust. So Claire, welcome to Saga Spaces and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much and nice to be here. It's lovely to have you. Now, I did want to ask before you, you, you launch into your talk, how did you become interested in the link between gut microbes and aging? Well, that's a very good question. I can remember really the exact moment when the penny dropped. Actually, it was when I just returned back to the wards. I'm, as you mentioned, I'm a clinical doctor. Um, after my PhD, my research PhD, and I was looking after a gentleman, a very sick man who was really quite unwell. And we noticed that he had really raised inflammatory markers in his blood, suggesting that there was some sort of infection going on. But we couldn't find any source of infection. When we did a CT scan, we found that the only area of his body that looked abnormal was the area around the colon but inside the colon looked fairly normal. What we realized at that time, there was lots of um, new work coming out about the gut microbiome. And I thought, ah, that's interesting. Could it be that maybe the gut microbiome in this gentleman is affected and then there's leakage of, of uh, either materials or bacteria into his body from his gut? Um, it's a very difficult situation in, you know, when you're dealing with someone like that um, clinically because what you really want to do is give them antibiotics. Um, and of course, that might be really the very best thing to do. But of course, that also destabilizes the microbes that live on us and within us. So that's the time when I was sort of really thinking, Sunny, about um, what could we do to really understand this further? Can we gain some evidence about it? Can we work out what it is that we could change? Can we turn the clock back and make um, older people's guts better so they're more resilient? Um, and don't cause these problems. Oh gosh, I mean, it's 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 all it's so fascinating, and it's very current, isn't it? You know, there are, there's a lot out there about it. But you're one of those key researchers, so to have you here to talk about it is 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 a real treat. So thank you very much. Now on to you, Professor Claire Steves, and your talk all about the amazing world of your microbiome, healthy eating, healthy aging. Well, thank you. So first question is you know, what is the microbiome? And I think that really the best way to think about it is like a walled garden, um, an incredibly individual walled garden that's grown up inside all of us um, all the way through our lives. So for example, mine is nearly 47 years old. And for 47 years, that microbiome has been growing and changing and altering itself. It's a very complex, integrative, um, mixture of different microbes that are all working together. So when we think about that walled garden, we're not thinking about a, a very neat veg patch where they're all just cabbages. Um, we're thinking about a really wild space, maybe more like a wild tropical rainforest, um, where there are lots of different species all interacting together, all feeding off each other, and then contributing to each other with whatever they produce, given the food that we eat. Um, so. Um, for example, I remember um, a few years back going to Croatia, where they leave wild areas um, all around the country. And there you see amazing wildflowers, different buzzing insects, 
all working together. That's really what we've got when we've got a really good functioning gut microbiome. So there are plenty of different species, but no one single species is dominant and they're all cooperating together and feeding and supporting each other. And in turn, then that's where we come in. So we as the host, we uh, have this walled garden. That it, we actually gain from it because it produces molecules that feed us as well. And we benefit from all the different trillions of chemicals that that garden produces. So what's really interesting about the gut microbiome as well is that we know that the, the wall of that garden is really important too. So this is comprised of the enterocytes. These are the cells that line the gut all the way from the mouth, all the way down to the bottom end. And the, the, the gut microbes actually feed the, that, those, that, that wall. They keep it integral. They keep it healthy. And in turn, our um, uh, gut wall actually also supports and maintains the gut microbiome. So um, it's these bacteria that are in the, in the wall, inside the lumen of the gut that produce lots of chemicals that interact with the lining of the gut, reinforce that wall and make sure it doesn't crumble. Um, so that's what I, what I mean when I'm talking about the gut microbiome. So then um, you might say, well, why are we talking about this now? Um, what's all the hype about? Why is it uh, so much now that we're all talking about it? And how do we know now that it exists so much? Well, actually, we've known about the gut microbiome in a way for, for many millennia even. Hippocrates talked about the gut and how the gut might be the source of lots of medicine. Um, but it wasn't really until about 100 years ago, 120 years ago, that a chap called Eli Mechnikoff um, was looking at how fermented products, fermented milk products, for example, like kefirs, how they might be really important for health and important for aging. And um, he started to investigate the possibility that we could actually change the gut microbiome that people have um, based on the new understanding that was coming on about microbes. We, people had just discovered really the role that microbes really play. But of course, then antibiotics came in and we got rather distracted across the 20th century by thinking about how we can just stamp down on microbes and get rid of them. So, so, so that was really important, wasn't it, in advancing our understanding of how to treat infections when they really take hold. Um, but it made us perhaps forget a little bit about the good microbes that might be in us and on us. And then it wasn't until about the turn of the century when we came to um, really the great major advances in the tools to understand the genomes, uh, the human genome, for example, you, you might remember in about year 2001, uh, we sequenced most of the human genome. It was the same tools that made us understand a bit more about the microbes around us. Um, so thinking back to when I was a medical student back in about 1994, when we were thinking about microbes that were in and without us, we would have to culture them. So we would use plates of agar, we would try and put them in to cupboards so that they were um, in environments which were, for example, starved of oxygen, so that microbes that might grow in the relatively oxygen-starved area of our gut might be able to be seen. But using that kind of culture method, we could really only get to about 30% of the microbes that are existing um, inside us. And that's where, if we used genomic techniques, we can really understand much more because we can actually look at a sample, see what's the DNA there. And scientists have done that millions of times. They've managed to catalog all the different microbes, what all the different genomes relate to all those different microbes, produce huge databases. So it's an effort that's taken scientists really from across the globe to document and catalog all the microbes that we think are known to man, as it were. And then we can look at them in relation to a single sample that we take. So you might take a sample from your kitchen, from your, your fridge. You, if you want to go somewhere, particularly the microbe, we might look at your dog's bed basket. Um, and you can take a sample from there and then align all the different pieces of DNA or RNA that you can see, and then match that against these catalogs of what people have understood as the microbes that, that exist in the world, and then get an idea of what microbes exist. And so over about sort of like the early 2000s, 
we were starting to do this, we were using particular marker genomes on the 16S ribosomal subunit, which is available and seen in every species to kind of, it's like a barcode where it gets to a rough approximation of what microbes might be there. And that's when we suddenly start seeing an explosion of understanding of how many microbes there are. And now we're using full, what we call shotgun mechanism, m- methods to really sequence all of the DNA, all of the material that's in a sample. So we can really understand exactly not just what bacteria are there or, or archaea or fungi or viruses, but what also they can do. What are the genes that they carry? What are the molecules that they can produce? Anyway, the point is that we've discovered an awful lot more species that exist. And we've also discovered a lot more about the capabilities of what they can do in terms of what molecules they can create. Um, We found that there's really much more complex communities. So in our gut, we have, you know, hundreds and thousands of different microbes all interacting together as a really complex system. So then what about aging and health? So how does this wonderful complex community um, change and impact our health? Well, let's think about three different ways. We, we talked earlier on about my gentleman um, who we thought may have had a slightly leaky gut. Basically, we didn't think that the wall of his, um, uh, of his gut was working anymore. And we know that healthy gut microbes can really support the wall of the gut and help it really function really well. So that's one way. Um, that they can help to be a good, to help to create a really good functioning barrier within the gut um, that helps protect us from all those other bugs that might be there, okay? That's the first thing. The second thing is the metabolites. So metabolites are these small molecules that are produced when a microbe digests um, um, something like a plant fiber. And um, the system can produce an awful lot more molecules than we can ourselves. So, um, There's a lot of food that we eat, particularly plant fibers, that actually ourselves with our own genes and our own sort of digestive juices, we can really make very little of. They'll just pass straight through us. Whereas our microbes can work on them and make them into different things. And then they can pass them on to other microbes who make further um, adjustments and changes, producing a whole range, a whole host of different molecules, these metabolites, which then can affect Um, our health. And we found that there are quite a few that really significantly impact our health in many different ways. And the third uh, way, the mechanism that that, um, the microbiome really affects our health is in training of the immune system. So remember, I talked about that fatty sort of apron that was inflamed in the gentleman that I was talking about. Well, we know that in 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 that fatty apron is really a very large um, sort of interconnecting web of um, white cell sort of glands. Um, Yeah, they're like glands that are in your neck, but they're in uh, the the tissues surrounding your gut. And that's where most of our immune cells are actually trained. And we know that the the microbiome is really very important in interacting with those immune cells and changing how they then respond to microbes elsewhere, pneumonia, et cetera, um, uh, and keep our body, in a sense, in a low level immune stress um, compared to um, if we didn't have those good microbes there. So it seems that bacteria, um, especially ones that work on these plant fibers I talked about, um, are really good at producing chemicals that are good for our health. Um, They appear to help the the, the gut wall be an appropriate barrier, produce metabolites, which have wide reaching effects and reduce the inflammation in the body. And we know that this is now robustly linked to actually changes in things like our mood, how happy we feel, um, our appetite, what we fancy eating that seem to be affected um, by the gut microbes, um, how our brain works, how quickly our brain's functioning, um, how our immune system works. But also we know that it actually impacts our body fat, um, our cardiovascular risk as well. And that has um, an impact on many different aging related diseases. And we've seen from animal experiments and also trials now in humans, that if you can change your microbes, you can actually change these healthy uh, indices. Now, with regard to how we age, this gets a little bit more complicated because some studies, some of the early studies, looked at really fit older adults, centenarians, and found that their microbes look really great. 
Well, that's not surprising because, of course, they've got there uh, to that very ripe old age, and that's probably because they've been very healthy. So what we see with aging is that as we grow up from a child into an adolescent, our microbiome stabilizes, becomes kind of unique to our cell. Through adulthood, it stays pretty similar, actually, might be hit by antibiotics here and there, but generally it comes back to our own. And then sort of lots of stuff, wobbles, wobbles happen when we reach about the age of 70 or so. Some people seem to be, be able to maintain a really good microbiome and other people, it seems to change. And we've shown and others shown that that change is generally related to frailty, the development of frailty. So when I say frail, I mean the accumulation of health problems that some people have that makes them particularly vulnerable, um, vulnerable to stresses, more likely in a sense to become unwell, need to go to hospital, maybe fall over, etc. Um, they can more easily get sick, um, more easily fall, more, more easily not be able to do activities of daily living. Um, and it's, it's, this, it's this problem which is associated most strongly with really ch big changes in the gut microbiome. Now, of course, as you get more frail, you do change what you eat. You do change what medications you might take, which we know affect the microbiome. Um, and of course, sometimes we really need those medications. Um, and so some of the changes we see are a consequence of the frailty rather than driving it. But we've been able to look at much earlier in adulthood, in, in, uh, in older adulthood, and we see that the development of frailty actually does seem to be driven by changes in the gut microbiome. And it seems to be that early on in the process, it's possible to change the microbiome and have an effect on inflammatory markers, on bone health, on cognition. Um, really excitingly, we've done a proper randomized, placebo-controlled, a double-blind trial where we've given some individuals a microbiome-boosting prebiotic. Um, the prebiotic I'm, we, we gave was inulin and FOS, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, and some, we gave them a sachet of something that looked exactly the same, but didn't have those effects. Yeah? And we saw that in just 12 weeks, we found that there were changes in their gut microbiome, but also crucially, changes in the speed of processing and the ability to function of their brain when measured by various complex computer tests that they were doing. So we saw a really, a really clear change that was associated with taking the prebiotic um, versus not taking a prebiotic. So I think that's one example of how we can keep our garden healthy. Um, so now I just really want to think about other ways, maybe um, uh, that sounds a bit much, taking sort of a sachet of prebiotic every morning, um, but let's think about something, some other ways that we can really help our microbiome, our walled garden be um, as good as it can be. Well, the first thing is, I think, really to take a different approach to how we eat, just a different approach to eating, really. We don't need to eat just for calories um, or even for low calories. We don't need to think just about calories. We need to think about the quality of the nutrients we're providing to this amazing walled garden inside of us. And really, that is all about um, providing that walled garden with really good plant material, plant fibers for it to really generate a really great fermenting chamber in a sense inside of us, yeah? So we want to give the food that common good bacteria are likely to really like. And then if they're in our environment, they'll grow and they'll thrive. And that's what, we, um, what will then really create a stable structure inside us. So the, the idea is really to take in as many plant fibers as possible. Um, with as many different colors as possible. And this is really interesting because it might not be just the microbiome, but it might be through polyphenols and flavonoids that are in all sorts of different plant, um, uh, different plant colors, different vegetables that may also um, boost our health. But particularly, particular foods that really boost the gut microbes are things like Jerusalem artichokes. Uh, that some of you may know as fartichokes uh, for good reason, but, but they, 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 they and chicory, they have um, this complex molecule called inulin in them, which happens to be the, the same molecule that we put in our trial. Um, inulin and FOS, which is a fermented version of inulin, basically, 
These are complex carbohydrates. We can't break them down ourselves, but the good back, but gut bacteria can. And they love it. Um, other things are apples, apple pectins, um, things that are in uh, um, uh, other fruits and vegetables like that. Nuts, including walnuts, they've been shown um, to alter the gut microbiome and also improve our inflammation in older people in particular. Um, basically, any plants will do. Um, what you need to try and do is substitute any kind of snacks that you might have with um, uh, plain fruit and vegetables or nuts, yeah? So um, that'll help you get your seven fruit and vegetables a day. Um, and that's probably, the, the gut microbiome is partly why seven vegetables and fruit a day are recommended now by the World Health Organization as the right thing to do. So that's number one. Get the right prebiotics in you. Prebiotics are things that the bacteria use. Um, the second thing is minimizing things that you might do to assault your gut microbiome. So, um, of course, the most important there is antibiotics. And of course, we all sometimes need antibiotics. Antibiotics has been something that's been a major reason why we've got a longer life expectancy. And particularly as we get older, we're more um, at risk of infection, actually. And that's a very common cause of admission to hospital, et cetera. So sometimes we really do need to take antibiotics. But I just think be careful about taking antibiotics when you don't need to. And if you do take antibiotics, make sure that you give your gut bacteria a really good boost from those plants and fruits and vegetables that um, will help, help them come back and bounce back um, after you finish the antibiotic course. And there are some other medications as well that we know that really affect the microbiome, including things like the proton pump inhibitors. So things like omeprazole and lansoprazole. They seem to change the shift because they change the stomach acid and therefore reduce what ends up going through your body and populating your gut. Um, the third thing, of course, is these so-called probiotics. So probiotics are good bacteria, basically. And um, probiotics are concoctions. They can be concoctions of bacteria that are grown and sold commercially. But um, remember that probably the best sort of probiotics are um, fermented foods. So things like sauerkraut, yogurt, cheese, um, vinegar. Um, some pickles, these are some examples that are in a standard sort of British diet. But almost every diet across the world really um, has got really good um, probiotics, so fermented foods in it. So we all, all know about sort of kombucha and miso maybe um, uh, and um, kimchi. These are sort of quite well um, resourced now in the UK, but almost every culture, including cultures in Ethiopia, in Nigeria, in South America have got their own specific sort of um, fermented foods that they eat. Um, and so, you know, you can really be adventurous about this. Um, just be a little bit careful about just going for pre probiotics that are um, sort of, uh, you know, from something that you buy in the supermarket that's labeled as such. Because, um, of course, manufacturers have to be pretty specific about what, whether or not there's a microbe in there. I'm a little bit more skeptical than, about that. Um, uh, and in a way, what we need to make sure is that um, we're giving the food for microbes that are naturally around in our environment to really thrive. Um, uh, and so that's what we need to do to, to make sure that our um, gut microbe is repopulated um, in the best way possible. So hopefully I've explained how there's lots of evidence now that the microbiota inside us make a difference to health and make a difference to how we age. Um, it's not just about obesity diabetes risk, heart disease, but also conditions like frailty, cognitive change with aging, bone health, things like that. And there's a lot that you can do on a daily basis to really care for your gut microbiome and therefore improve the health of your whole body. Um, so what about try, trying experimenting with a few new food combinations? When was the last time that you had a Waldorf salad uh, yeah, that has, you know, Waldorf salad, If you, especially if you supplement the mayonnaise for some yogurt, you've got yogurt in there, which is a nice pro, um, a, a probiotic. You've got apples and um, uh, celery, which have really got great um, fibers in them. And then you've got walnuts, brilliant combination of good, delicious fertilizer. Thank you so much to all of you for coming to today's talk. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Uh, we hope to see you again very soon at another Saga Spaces talk. But until then, bye-bye for now.